So, hey everyone, I'm Khalid Hamshu. I'm a third year medical student, and uh, I'll be giving you the PAL on the epilepsy clinical lecture. It's very easy, alhamdulillah. Shouldn't take more than an hour, maybe an hour and a half, depends on how we run through it. So, before we get started, I just want to point out a few things. Um, I'll be going over some slides I made, about like 20, 25 slides that literally cover the entire lecture in a very simplified form because the lecture isn't that complicated and uh, it really doesn't need that many slides. So I condensed all the information that is necessary into these slides. And after that, I'll run through the actual lecture to cover any points I might have missed on these slides because I didn't include everything. So yeah, that's about all. So um, before we start, do you guys hear me clearly so we don't have any troubles? Any concerns before we start? Yes, everything is good. Thank you. All right, awesome. So uh, let me keep the chat open here as well so I can see it on the side. I don't know if you guys can see the chat, but whatever. All right. Oh, I'll keep an eye on it. All right, let's get started. So first, I want to start off with some simple definitions over here. Um, obviously, <laughs> this lecture is a bit informal. So um, I'll clarify anything that looks uh, interesting on the slide. So epilepsy is defined as two or more unprovoked seizures within 24 hours. This is epilepsy. Now, what exactly is an unprovoked seizure, though? It's a seizure that just happens. No reason, no cause. It just occurs. And uh, what do we call it? That would be, in, in that case, if it happens without a cause, for example, say a uh, stroke or say a uh, lack of sleep or anything like that, then we would call it an unprovoked seizure. It's like you sort of have an idea of why the seizure is happening, but we don't exactly know why. So that's an unprovoked seizure. Now, a seizure, obviously, as you know, is neurons go crazy with electricity. They become synchronized together. And when they fire at the same time, they cause a seizure. Now, depending on where the seizure is, it can have different manifestations. We'll cover that in just a bit. And lastly, the last two things I want to clarify here is the difference between a focal and a generalized seizure. So a focal is a seizure in one area of the brain. And generalized seizure is basically the whole brain. Everything is affected. Every single neuron in the brain is firing. So um, I just want to point out something here real quick. This is off AMBOSS. But uh, a seizure or multiple provoked seizures don't like uh, are, or are not enough to diagnose epilepsy. So again, epilepsy is two or more unprovoked seizures and unprovoked meaning things like I can't do something to trigger a seizure. I can probably induce it, but there's no specific cause of the seizure. This is what epilepsy is. That's the most important distinction between epilepsy and like a provoked seizure. So just keep that in mind. All right. So what's going on in the brain during a seizure? So obviously we're not exactly sure why, like what exactly is happening in the brain. It's still an active area of research, but what we do know is that there is a balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Excitatory neurons are usually the major ones in the brain are glutamatergic neurons, meaning they release glutamate as a neurotransmitter, as you're aware. And the inhibitory neurons are GABAergic neurons, meaning they release the major inhibitory neurotransmitter, which is GABA. So there's a balance between these two. This balance can get disrupted for whatever reason. Uh, you knock out the inhibitory neurons, the excitatory neurons take over. Depending on where exactly in the brain they take over, they can trigger a different type of seizure. And uh, what do we call it? And obviously, the seizure begins firing. Now, at some point, these inhibitory, inhibitory neurons realize, oh, crap, I need to come back and inhibit these guys. So they start firing again, and they limit the seizure. That's why seizures are generally self-limited. Sometimes they continue for a very long time. That's a special condition. We'll cover it later. It's called status epilepticus. But generally, the inhibitory neurons will recover and will shut down the excitatory neurons and stop the seizure on its own. Now, what do we call it? It's very important to mention the, the like the actual pathophysiology of the seizure and what's exactly happening on a cellular mechanism isn't exactly important, like at least for your block and for the exam itself, because it's actually just an active area of research. There is a lecture, I think, by Dr. Shawaf on the seizures and epilepsy lecture. 
I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, he goes into the details of this stuff. So you can, like, uh, whatever he mentions on his slides, just go over it. But it's not that important, at least in this, in the context of the clinical lecture. All right. So what are the phases of a seizure? So seizures generally fall into like four, three phases. They don't have to follow these phases. Sometimes they just go into the seizure itself and just go right after it. Sometimes they do. Now, a lot of the seizures have something known as the prodromal, uh, sorry, prodromal and oral phase. These generally are grouped up together. Basically, uh, like if you ask a lot of the patients, the what do we call it, experience recurrent seizures, um, what they tend to tell you is, oh, I feel this, this, this right before I have a seizure. For example, they feel nauseous. They may get deja vu, which, by the way, deja vu means um, like, uh, uh, how do I describe it? Like as if you've seen something before, even though you haven't. It's like you're predicting the future. You know, when you're like uh, sitting at a restaurant and, for example, you remember yourself drinking a cup of coffee. Yeah, it's that sort of feeling. But like uh, uh, usually it happens a lot in patients who experience a lot of seizures. So any of these could be indicative of auras, and this could be a clue for the patient that a seizure is about to happen. It doesn't have to be necessarily there. Actually, most of the time it isn't there, but uh, it's useful when it is there. Now, ectal phase is the actual seizure itself. So ectal means seizure over here, if you're not aware. And during this phase, the seizure is happening. Whatever happens in a seizure happens. We get over that. And then we... After all of this, the seizure finishes, we're happy now, we get to the post-ectal period. The post-ectal period is uh, basically the period that comes right after the seizure. It could last, out, it could last a few hours to even a day. Usually uh, the brain is kind of fatigued by all this firing craziness that's going on, so it kind of needs some time to recover. And during this recovery time, the patient is usually like confused. They're not 100% aware. They're kind of out of it. Just imagine someone who got knocked out with a punch and uh, what do we call it? Got a little bit dizzy. He needs a few days to recover. Same thing here. Uh, sometimes, by the way, in the post-ectal period, especially if a seizure is affecting the muscles, there is, uh, what do we call it? There's a state in the muscle where it goes per paralyzed. It's called Todd's paralysis. So um, let me just write it down very quickly. Um, called Todd's, uh, I'm writing with a, what do we call it, with a, a mouse trackpad, so excuse me, I, I didn't get my pen today. So it's called Todd's paralysis. So this pods, Todd's paralysis is sometimes confusing. It may look like a stroke. So remember strokes, they may cause, like depending on where the stroke is, it may cause paralysis to specific limbs. Sometimes you can confuse this with this. But like a lot of the seizures have this Todd's paralysis. Todd's paralysis is basically a fancy term to saying, yo, I can't use this limb because it went under a seizure. It'll recover in a few days, so it'll be fine. It's not something permanent. But yeah, it's just one way to tell that you are in this post-ectal phase as well. Um, any questions? You guys have any concerns? You want me to clarify anything? If I'm going too fast, I can slow down. Um, if not, I'll just move on. All right, so clear off this. All right. Um, so what flavors do seizures come in or types? Um, so most people divide them into two main categories. So seizures can be divided as focal seizures or generalized seizures, as we mentioned earlier. Focal seizures, again, they are seizures that affect only specific groups of neurons. Say your, your brain is made up of uh, 20 sets of neurons, 20 groups of neurons, say only two of them are affected, uh, that would be a focal seizure. Now, if all 20 sets of neurons are affected, that would be a generalized seizure. Now, the, the interesting thing about focal seizures is that they can transform into generalized seizures. The way they do it is, uh, imagine you have a brain over here. I'm just going to draw a circle here and like split it in half. I'm not a good drawer. Drawer. Um, like, for example, say a focal seizure starts on the left side of the brain over here. If for some reason it starts moving all the way here to the thalamus, for example, and it spreads all around, that would be a generalized seizure or a secondarily generalized seizure, meaning it started focal and then it transformed into a generalized seizure. So, um, yeah, that, those are generally the two types of seizures. This is the most important thing when it comes to them. 
So uh, our task here is to just tell the difference between a focal seizure and a generalized seizure. So uh, let's just jump straight into that. Um, okay. So focal seizures also come in two flavors. So these seizures are classified as either focal seizures with no impairment in awareness, and this was uh, this used to be called simple partial seizure. It might still be called simple partial seizure in your lecture. I don't know if it was updated, but this is the new name for it. So whatever you see, just uh, you know, follow whatever you see in the lecture. Just follow. It's the same thing. Basically, this seizure is a seizure where there's no impairment in awareness. So um, yeah, that's literally the only difference between these two. They're pretty much the same, but uh, there's no loss of consciousness. So awareness is consciousness in this case. Um, the other type of focal seizure is a focal seizure with impaired awareness, also called complex partial seizure. So um, the only difference again here is the awareness itself. If you lose consciousness, um, this is a complex seizure. If you do not lose consciousness, this is a, a regular focal seizure. Again, focal seizures only affect one side of the brain. They don't affect both sides. So the manifestations are only on one side, one side, or like one portion. It's not the whole thing. Uh, basically, the question depends on the patient's conscious. So make sure they're alive. Yep. All right. So how the heck do I know if it's a focal seizure? Like, what are the symptoms of a focal seizure? Again, it depends, obviously. So again, we mentioned some patients have auras. Um, this is especially true if the seizure is a complex seizure or a seizure with loss of consciousness. Um, they tend to have auras, but it doesn't have to be there again. Again, auras are the things that you see right before, or sorry, the patient experiences right before a seizure happens. Now, suppose a seizure happens in the area that affects the right big toe. So what would happen there? So the seizure would just trigger, uh, sorry, the seizure would affect the neurons affecting this portion of the brain and the right big toe would start, you know, twitching. Suppose the seizure affects the area of the smell. So that could be, uh, what do we call it? That could manifest as things that, what do we call it? You smell, like it doesn't have to be there, but you're smelling something. For example, these crayons over here, I'm sure you can smell them right now, but, uh, if, uh, it, <clears throat> what do we call it? If the seizure affects the olfactory region, meaning the smell region of the brain, then it would manifest with smell manifestations. If it affects emotions, um, it could manifest in an emotional way. For example, fear or laughter or deja vu or like any emotion you can think of, literally. So again, focal seizures don't have a specific presentation. You can't like say to yourself, Okay, if I see a patient like this, aha, this is the focal seizure that I'm looking for. Uh, not really, because focal seizures just are completely different from each other. They're not the same. Uh, it, it sucks, but this is how it is. For example, uh, what do we call it? Uh, other like manifestations of this could be like automatism, which is like smacking the lips like this. Or moving the tongue out or like, uh, what do we call it? There's a, there's a whole lot of presentations. Uh, okay, so what do you mean by, by deja vu? So deja vu is basically the, what do we call it? The sensation of, uh, I don't know how to describe it to you, but one sec, let me think of a good way to describe it. So it's the sensation of, uh, it, it's like the way, or it's like the feeling of seeing something, like it's, it's as if you've seen something in the future. So for example, in a dream, you might've dreamt of, drinking a cup of water in Cane's, for example, the restaurant. And maybe 20 days later, you find yourself drinking a cup of coffee in Cane's. That is, and then you're like, oh, wait, I've seen this before. So that's deja vu. It's the sensation of thinking that you've seen something before, even though you haven't. By the way, you have not seen the future in that case. It's your brain playing a trick on you, thinking that you've seen this before, but you haven't. All right, perfect. Um, any other questions before we move on? Uh, by the way, we are speeding through this lecture. No? Okay. Uh, 
again, any confusion, anything that you're not getting, you can just ask me right away. The whole point of this is for you guys to ask questions. If not, then uh, I'll just move on. So again, focal seizures depend on where the neurons are affected. If they're affected in the occipital lobe or the, what do we call it? Yeah, the occipital lobe, then the patient would see hallucinations. If they're affecting the, uh, what do we call it? The hippocampus, they'll start making up memories, etc. It just depends on where the seizure is happening. So uh, yeah, that's about all for the presentation of focal seizures. So again, simply put, focal seizures only focus or present on one side of the brain and the symptoms depend on which lobe or sets of neurons are affected. So again, somatosensory neurons or the ones for you know touch uh, and uh, vibration, all that fancy stuff, are could present with paresthesia. So you feel tingling in the fingers or tingling in the leg or tingling in the toes. If it's in the occipital lobe, it's hallucinations. You start seeing things, etc., etc., etc. All right. So quick note: um, there is a special type of focal seizures. It's not really that special, but it is sort of special. It's called a Jacksonian seizure. So, oh, my bad. So a Jacksonian seizure is a seizure that just starts in one area of the brain, say it starts over here. So suppose this is the temporal lobe over here or uh, the primary motor cortex. Actually, that's a better example. Uh, the motor cortex, whatever. Say it starts here and it starts moving. The seizure starts moving across the neurons. Um, it would manifest as a progressive seizure. So for example, it starts in the right arm over here, or sorry, the right hand, and the seizure starts moving all the way down to my shoulder. That would be a Jacksonian seizure because it's just moving. It's still affecting one side of the brain. It's still a focal seizure, but it's a moving seizure. And in that case, when it moves, it's called a Jacksonian march. It's just a special term. By the way, Jack mean, is the guy that discovered the seizure. That's about all. But uh, a march, uh, the Jacksonian march is the movement of the seizure itself. Uh, so yeah, I think I saw this mentioned in the lecture just to clarify on this, but it is just a focal seizure affecting the primary motor cortex or the area responsible for moving your uh, voluntary muscles. So yeah, that's a Jacksonian seizure. All right, we finished with the generalized seizures. Uh, sorry, the focal seizures. Let's talk about the generalized seizures. So again, generalized seizures affect the whole brain and they probably arise in the thalamus. The reason is because the thalamus, as you know, and it has probably been knowing for a very long time, it, 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 this guy is connected to everything. Like it goes to your cortex, it goes to the brainstem, it goes to all, all sorts of places, every lobe. So it, if, and obviously what do we call it? it it's also connected with consciousness. So um, like the seizures are hypothesized to at least affect the thalamus. So this is why they probably arise there. And uh, what do we call it? If a focal seizure, remember when we talked about focal seizures over here, secondarily generalizing, where is it? Yeah, right here. Remember when we said they can transform from this to that? Well, the, the way they do it is the, the seizure just kind of moves from one side of the brain, goes to the thalamus and spreads everywhere. This is how it, do, uh, this is how it does it. Or it could just start here. So this is what a generalized seizure is. Now, generalized seizures are generally uh, or mostly have a loss of consciousness because it the thalamus is involved and the thalamus is involved with consciousness to some sort of extent. So this is why you usually have a loss of consciousness uh, in, what do we call it, in generalized seizures. Cool. All right. So let's discuss the different types or flavors of uh, generalized seizures. So generalized seizures come in two forms. Uh, this is just one classification, but this is the most used classification. They could be motor generalized seizures or non-motor generalized seizures. So motor generalized seizures fall, like generally fall into five or six categories. So they could fall into the tonic, clonic, clonic, tonic, myoclonic, and atonic. So the only difference between all these is the way the muscles move. So it's pretty easy to wrap your head around. Uh, just one tip, just know what these words mean. So tonic means tone, which means which comes from muscle contraction. Clonic means the twitchy, jerky movement of muscles. So just remember that when you're reading uh, the types of seizures. So tonic clonic is the one you probably know. Muscles contract, then start twitching. So there would be a phase of muscle contraction. The patient would start becoming very rigid. When they're rigid, they tend to fall on the ground forward. And what do we call it? They kind of hold the, the they hold the posture for some time. 
and every muscle is contracting in the body. Literally every muscle you can think of, even the airway. That's why they begin choking, by the way. After that, there's the clonic phase. Clonic meaning, uh, you know, jerky muscle contraction. So the patient will start shaking around. That's probably the, the, the form you're familiar with. So yeah, that's literally what a tonic clonic seizure is. Now, every other type of seizure is just a, what do we call it? Like a subcategory of this, uh, or sorry, uh, like a one portion of this seizure. So a clonic seizure would just be the jerky movement. So the muscles go rogue and turn on and off. Uh, the tonic one is just the muscles contracting and holding on for dear life. So they just contract and never have the clonic phase. They never start the jerky movements. They're just contracting. And eventually they do relax once the seizure is over. Uh, the myoclonic seizure is the one that is basically very similar to the clonic seizure, except the muscle contractions are slightly faster. So they twitch a lot more. And usually this happens in the morning with children. This, this is mostly with children. So if you see a child that wakes up with, uh, what do we call it? with involuntary muscle contractions. It's usually a myoclonic seizure. It's called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy if it's recurrent. So um, yeah, this is just a side fact. I don't think it's part of the lecture, but yeah. And an atonic seizure, uh, A meaning without, tonic means tone. So muscles just lose their will to live. They relax and the patient drops. Usually the drop is backwards. Uh, you can tell the difference between atonic and the uh, tonic version. Tonic uh, muscle contractions causes the patient to fall forward. Atonic, usually the patient drops backwards. Obviously, it's dangerous because this predisposes to trauma. They can hit their head on concrete, and that's not good for you. So, yeah, just remember that. Uh, let me clear the slide off. Ink. Cool. All right. So, uh, what do we call it? Finally, we have the non-motor generalized seizures. It's basically the same, but there's no movement of muscles. Uh, there's only one type that's really relevant. It's called the absence seizure. So absence or absence seizure is when the, it's usually in children. What happens is the child zones out. So for example, I could be giving a lecture and uh, a child, or sorry, a child could be listening to a class or a teacher. They, for some reason, start zoning out like this. They start blinking and they lose consciousness for a few seconds to even minutes. And then they come back. And uh, what do we call it? This is generally what an absence seizure is. One note, one thing to note in absence seizures, there is no, remember that post-ectal period we talked about right here, right there, the confusion? Yeah, in absence seizures, this does not exist. <laughs> There's no confusion right after the seizure, meaning the child will jump straight back into it. They won't be dizzy. They won't be confused. They'll just continue from there on uh, onwards without any of the, you know, the lethargy that comes right after the seizure. So this is a very, 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 very important thing about absence seizures. There is no post-ectal confusion. This is just one thing to remember. If there's one thing to remember about the seizure, it's this thing. And uh, yeah, what do we call it? Uh, by the way, guys, I am simplifying a lot of this, but I'll go over the, sli the lecture slides after this. This is sort of like a, a introduction, I guess, to the lecture. But uh, yeah, it shouldn't take too long. All right, so just differentiate. So the, the main point of this, like the main point of the generalized seizures, the, the, what you got to do is differentiate between them. So you don't need to know the exact symptoms because their symptoms are generally related to the muscle contractions. Just know the difference between them when they are described in a clinical scenario and it's literally all you need. So yeah, all right. Just a small quick break. Uh, if you feel like answering, go ahead. If you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, yeah, I'll continue outwards with the like the causes and the, uh, what do we call it and what to do when a patient presents with a seizure. <clears throat> so I'll continue in like two minutes. Any questions, guys? Any concerns? No. Let's see. 
All good? All right. I guess I'll continue from there then. Since uh, we're going along pretty quickly, so uh, I don't think we should waste too much time. It shouldn't take too long, hopefully. All right, so let's see. If I can really just remove this, see on the screen. All right, perfect. All right, so what causes seizures? So like uh, I recommend knowing this acronym called vitamins. Uh, by the way, I stole this off osmosis, so uh, very good video. You can watch it about seizures, but generally the causes of seizures fall into one of these categories. So V stands for vascular causes. Vascular meaning literally anything related to a blood vessel. So it could be a stroke, could be an AV malformation, which by the way means arteriovenous malformation. This is sort of congenital. The arteries and veins kind of look weird and that can cause issues with blood supply and that can trigger a stroke. Um, or sorry, can trigger like a ischemia and yeah, stroke. Strokes themselves, whatever type of stroke, hemorrhagic, uh, ischemic, any, any of the types of stroke can trigger a seizure. And this is one cause of a seizure. Remember these causes, um, what do we call it? Trigger seizures, not epilepsy. Um, if these are identified, then the diagnosis would not be epilepsy, it would be the actual underlying cause. So for example, if they have, they had a stroke and they had a seizure secondary to the stroke, their diagnosis isn't seizure. Their diagnosis is a stroke. So yeah. Uh, I is for infection. This could be meningitis or encephalitis. I'm not sure if you guys took a lecture on these. You probably will if you haven't. Bacteria eat the brain, brain goes ah, and then uh, what do we call it? You get a seizure out of it. Very simple, very straightforward. Trauma or toxins. So uh, mouse flying flip-flop can hit you in the head. You can get shot. Uh, drugs, alcohols, and poison, especially drugs and alcohol, can trigger seizures, especially if it is a withdrawal seizure. Uh, alcohol can trigger uh, seizures just from withdrawal, especially in alcoholics. Actual drinking of alcohol can also dr trigger a seizure, but it mostly is associated with withdrawal of these drugs and toxins. So uh, that's very important to point out. Autoimmune causes, so body attacks itself, and that can obviously, if they're attacking uh, neurons, that can trigger a seizure because the neurons are dying. They're releasing their neurotransmitters when they die. That causes other neurons to start firing and that can trigger a seizure. So one example is lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis as well. Um, you have metabolic causes, metabolic, uh, for example, things uh, like imbalances in electrolyte levels, hyponatremia, which is too little sodium in the blood, hypernatremia, the opposite, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, remember that action potential stuff? Yeah, that. And obviously you have other metabolic causes like diabetes. Diabetes can trigger acidosis and uh, even alkalosis itself can trigger seizures. These imbalances in pH can trigger seizures. You have gen genetic metabolic disorders. You know that mold stuff you took last year, they can also trigger seizures because of accumulation of different substances in that brain. And uh, that can cause the death of neurons and trigger a seizure as well. Idiopathic meaning we don't know. And we just pin it on epilepsy. Again, when you don't know why a seizure is happening, it's epilepsy. And obviously you need, again, just to remind you of the definition, it's two unprovoked seizures, unprovoked meaning unknown cause, within a 24-hour period. All right. Uh, and neoplasm is like benign or malignant tumors, or like any of the tumors mentioned in Dr. Ahmed's lecture, they can also trigger a seizure purely by compression of the actual brain tissue or by taking away from its blood supply. So malignant tumors tend to steal blood supply and that can cause uh, seizure to trigger. And finally, S in vitamin stands for syncope. Syncope isn't a seizure. This S stands for differential diagnoses of seizure, meaning like other things that, can, uh, or sorry, other things that cause loss of consciousness that aren't seizures. In this case, syncope. Syncope is not a seizure. And uh, what do we call it? The most important thing is to differentiate these causes from the actual seizure itself. So we'll discuss that right now. But actually, I lied to you. We'll discuss uh, the most common causes of epilepsy by age first, and then I'll discuss the, the differences between these seizures. So uh, between seizures and uh, other causes, or other forms of loss of consciousness. So let's talk about the most common causes of epilepsy by age. And this is very, very straightforward.
um, in children, generally, if they have a seizure or they experience epilepsy, the cause is usually genetic, meaning that they have a genetic problem going on, Down syndrome, uh, Patel syndrome, any of the, you know, that genetic stuff you learned about uh, at some point and you will continue learning about, that can cause seizure and it's probably the most common cause of seizure in children. Fevers can trigger seizures. They're not epilepsy. They're called febrile seizures. Um, uh, these are a known cause of seizure. They can be resolved once the infection is resolved. Trauma and infection, less likely. So, so I would just remember the most common cause for each age. You don't need to remember the second or third. Adults usually experience seizures because of tumors. So um, glioblastoma, multiforme. Uh, meningiomas, that stuff, those can compress the brain and trigger uh, seizures and epilepsy. Uh, other causes are trauma and strokes, less likely. Um, in elderly, it's actually strokes that are the most common. They're very, very susceptible to strokes. When there is a seizure the, in, elder, in an elderly patient, generally the first thing we do is do a CT MRI to check for strokes. I think a clinical lecture was given on strokes yesterday. So uh, yeah, sorry, a PAL lecture. Uh, so yeah, I can refer to that. All right, so what exactly looks like a seizure but isn't a seizure and how the hell do we differentiate it? So uh, there are multiple things that look like seizures but aren't exactly seizures. These are things like syncope, psychogenic seizures, TIA, vertigo, migraines with auras, these may look like seizures, sometimes very, very close to seizures. And that's why it's very important to differentiate it. I'll go over it right here. It's down here. So syncope is like a form of cardiovascular manifestation. Basically, uh, it's passing out. Um, generally, it is categorized by sweating before syncope and lightheadedness. They may also have tonic and clonic movements, which make them very, very confusing with seizures. The way you differentiate it from a seizure is after a patient wakes up from syncope, or if they do pass out, they don't have post-ectal confusion, meaning that they jump straight back into it. Like they fall on the ground, they do their tonic-clonic thing, but they're not confused right after. So this is how you tell a syncope from a seizure, usually but you still need to examine. They need imaging, you need history, all that. You still need all of that, but this is one way that can guide you towards syncope rather than seizure. Psychogenic seizures are psychiatric seizures. Basically, a patient pretends to have a seizure. They're not actually pretending. It's like, it's sort of a psychiatric condition. They're having a seizure, but they're not actually having a seizure. Usually the way you can tell them is through EEG when they have the episode. Uh, EEG will show normal brain activity, not abnormal brain activity. By the way, EEG stands for electroencephalogram, just, uh, just in case you're confused. Transient ischemic attacks or TIAs or stroke wannabes. Basically, they're strokes, but less than 30 minutes, no, no irreversible damage. They can mimic a uh, seizure because they're very short. Uh, the way you tell them apart from strokes is usually the post-ectal confusion. Uh, someone just asked something in chat. Hypoglycemic shock can mimic seizures. Yes, it can. Uh, yes, it can. And that's why it's very important. I forgot to add it on the slide. Thank you for mentioning. That is actually a very, very common cause of uh, passing out that can look like uh, seizures. So yeah, hypoglycemic attacks. Um, so next is vertigo. Vertigo is dizziness and uh, it lasts minutes to days. It could last for minutes to days. Most important thing to tell a vertigo from a seizure, especially if the vertigo is very severe and can cause you to pass out, is positional symptoms. Usually patients with vertigo, at least peripheral uh, vertigo, um, have positional symptoms, meaning if they're leaning one way or another, they get symptoms, but if they fix it the other way around, they don't get symptoms. This is how you tell it apart. And finally, migraines with auras may have like visual hallucinations and disturbances, and that can look like a visual uh, seizure. And again, the way you tell this apart from the other sorts of seizures, uh, or the way you tell a migraine from a seizure, again, is the post-ectal confusion and uh, other signs of seizures and that I'll discuss when I'm going through Dr. Lukawi's slides. So um, just important, this is less likely to be, by the way,
And this is the least likely. So the most likely would be like syncope, TIA, hypoglycemic attacks, vertigo, um, and psychogenic seizures, and less likely are migraines. So again, super important, post-ectal confusion and tongue biting because the muscles in the jaw are contracting in a seizure, usually in generalized seizures, are absent if uh, the if a patient is experiencing one of these things. Usually it is absent. It can be there sometimes, and this can make life confusing, but usually they are absent. So this is the way you tell, uh, and for all practice, for all practical purposes, just remember the post-ectal confusion and maybe the tongue biting less important as the distinguishing feature between these and a seizure itself. Cool. Um, okay. So what the heck do I do if a seizure happens in front of me? Um, there are steps to follow. And uh, what do we call it? This is the whole point of the clinical lectures to know what to do after when a seizure does happen. Step number one, make sure it's actually a seizure. So the way you make sure it's actually a seizure, I'll go over in just a second. The second thing you need to do is check if it's a first time seizure, if it is a seizure, or they've had a seizure before and it's epilepsy. Like if they have been diagnosed with epilepsy before and something else is going on. So first off, making sure it's actually a seizure. How do you make sure it's actually a seizure? The way you make sure it's actually a seizure is through history, physical exam, and labs. Labs and imaging. So history, physical exam, labs, and imaging. These are the four things you can do to make sure it's actually a seizure. So again, remember the causes of seizures, of the things that mimic seizures over here. What we do is when we do the workup through labs specifically, labs are the most important part of this along with history. When we're looking at the labs, we look at a CBC, we look at liver function tests, we look at different uh, labs, and that can point us to specific um, like uh, differentials for seizures rather than the seizure itself. So if these labs are all normal and there's nothing that seems to be wrong, then it's probably a seizure. Uh, and the imaging, of course, by the way, it is probably a seizure that's happening. If these labs are showing something that is triggering a seizure, then we need to investigate further. I'll, I'll clarify. It's a bit confusing. I'll clarify it in the next slide. After making sure that it's a seizure, we need to check uh, I forgot to add a step here, but uh, I'll, I'll imply it in the next slide again. We need to check if it's the seizure of a first time or they've had a previous seizure before. Now, it, it's very simple if they've had epilepsy before. Very, very simple to deal with. If they had a seizure before and they're diagnosed with epilepsy and they are on medication, and even if they aren't on medication, the most important thing to do, the next step, is to check if the medication is actually working. So you check the dose, you check the serum level of the medication, you check whether they're actually complying with the medication or not. And from there, if there is a problem with that aspect, then you fix it and the seizure or the epilepsy episodes would start resolving. If there doesn't seem to be a problem with the medication, then we need to check for other causes of seizures. For example, remember these over here, vascular infection, trauma, that, that stuff. We need to check for them by specific tests. So for vascular, we can do CT, MRI, infection, we do, can do a lumbar puncture, trauma toxins, we can do blood work, same thing for autoimmune, same thing for metabolic, same thing for neoplasm. So we check for these because uh, sometimes uh, seizures can happen for multiple different causes. So we need to make sure we're not missing something. And at the same time, we need to check why, uh, what do we call it? Why the drugs aren't working. So for example, everything comes back normal. We need to check why these drugs aren't working. Uh, did someone like open it up? Okay. So we need to check if these drugs aren't working. And if they aren't working, we can add more medication or we can consider more aggressive approaches to treat the, seizure, the intractable seizures, meaning seizures that don't resolve. So these could be through resection. I'll cover them through Dr. Okawi's slides in just a second. Um, yeah. Uh, one second. Something is popping up on my screen, and I don't know how to remove it. Uh, one moment. Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> 
Uh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. So um, that's generally the steps if they are medicated and they do have epilepsy. Now, suppose this is a first time seizure. What, what, what do we do? Well, again, we need to make sure if it is a seizure first, that's the first step. So you do it through a workup. You do CBC, LFTs, which are liver function tests. You do serum glucose for the hypoglycemia. You do a bunch of different things. You check the history. You check the physical. After making sure it is a seizure, the next thing is to find a cause for the seizure. So we're trying to find the cause because the diagnosis of epilepsy is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that if there is no cause, then we diagnose it with epilepsy. So we need to like test everything until... We can't find anything. So if you suspect a stroke that triggered the seizure, you do CT MRI. If you suspect infection, you can do a lumbar puncture to rule out encephalitis, meningitis. Obviously, history would point you this way. For example, someone who traveled to a new country or someone who went to Hajj. These could point towards infection. If they have syncope, then you can do a 12-lead ECG to check for cardiac problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whatever you suspect from these causes up here, you can do the test that corresponds to this. So for example, you get an exam question over here uh, <clears throat> about someone who has had palpitations, someone who's had heart problems. Uh, well, the next best step after like suspecting a seizure or syncope is to do a 12 lead ECG in this case. It would be one of the options there. So just keep that in mind when you are going through uh, some of the questions in the exam. The next step is if you don't find a cause for the seizure is to do an EEG. So you make sure uh, usually EEG is last resort when it comes to these things. It's the last sort of imaging modality you use. And EEG is usually used to identify whether or not the seizure is focal or generalized. But, you know, between you and me, EEG is kind of useless for the most part. It cannot detect a lot of the seizures. But when it does show up on EEG, it's pretty useful, but it really doesn't show up most of the time. So, uh, yeah, but we still do it anyways. So we identify whether a seizure is focal or generalized. After we do that, if and even if we don't identify whether a seizure is focal or generalized, then it can fall into two categories. If the cause is identified, you treat the underlying cause. If they had a stroke, you treat the stroke. If they had syncope, you, you treat whatever heart problem they have. If they have diabetes, you control the diabetes. If they have this, they you treat that. Basically, this is how you treat the seizure, by treating the underlying cause. If there is no cause identified, then you can diagnose them, or you could consider diagnosing them with epilepsy if the seizure is recurrent. If it keeps happening, you diagnose them with epilepsy, and then you start anti-epileptic medications because... These guys are always experiencing seizures and you need to control them. They're, you know, it kind of affects their life. So if you don't control the seizures, you know, they can lead to depression. It can be, be pretty nasty things. So you start them on anti-epileptic medications. Very, very, very important here. Anti-epileptic medications are not given for people who only experience one seizure. If they've only had one seizure for whatever cause it is, you don't give them anti-epileptic medication. There's no point. Anti-epileptic medication is reserved only for epilepsy or for special call, uh, special indications, which I'll discuss in just a moment. Again, anti-epileptic medications are only given for epilepsy, not for one-time seizures. <clears throat> All right. So how do you treat epilepsy? So there are a bunch of anti-epileptic drugs. And you can also treat it through lifestyle modifications. These drugs, there are some that are first line, some that are second line, some that are third line. Just follow the lecture on that one. Dr. Lukawi mentions them there. So whatever he lists as first line is first line. Like in the U.S., they have different first line medications. Whatever it is, follow it through the lecture. So the general principle is you start with one drug. Then you increase its dose, and if that's not working, then you add another drug. And if that's not working, then you can do more aggressive approaches, like uh, checking for underlying cause for the seizures. You might have missed it. And then you can do surgical resection. You can remove parts of the brain that are like experiencing the seizure. You can just cut them out if they're not vital. And that can you know, symptomatically treat the seizure. They would be relieved off of it. There's a technique called brain stimulation. I'll cover it in a bit.
uh, you can do that as well to treat the, uh, the symptoms of epilepsy. All right, so uh, some of the last things I wanna cover in this is there are some random treatments that you probably need to know about. Epson seizures are treated with a drug called ethosuximide. Very important to know. Probably covered in the pharma lecture, but reinstating it here, this is very, very, very important. This is like literally the only, uh, what do we call it? One of the only like seizure conditions that is treated with a specific medications. Uh, this is sort of out of scope of the lecture, but you know, I've seen it once, but eclampsia is like a condition pregnant women experience. They have, uh, seizures with like a bunch of, uh, like, uh, blood, uh, blood circulation issues. You treat the seizures with something known as magnesium sulfate. You don't need to know the details, but it's just, just keep it in mind. Uh, not very important, but eclampsia is treated with magnesium sulfate. It's kind of specific. So, yeah. All right. Lastly, um, what do we call it? What do we do if a seizure starts but doesn't stop? That's called status epilepticus. In the lecture, Dr. Al-Qawi defines it as 30 minutes of a seizure without regaining consciousness. And obviously, newer sources say it's five minutes only. Uh, but in the lecture, it is 30 minutes. So please stick to the lecture. In this case, like if you do follow external resources, they will say five minutes. But in the lecture, it is 30 minutes and stick to the lecture in this case. This is a medical emergency, must be treated right away. The way we treat it is through three steps. Step number one, we stabilize the patient, you know, ECG, all of that, check they're fine. Airway, breathing, circulation, that stuff. You get that out of the way. Then you start treating the actual seizure. So you start with IV anti-epileptic medications. These could be like, um, you know, Valproate, Levetiracetam, all the medications you learned about, whatever it is. Uh, one important medication I forgot to mention here is a benzodiazepine. It isn't exactly a anti-epileptic medication, but it sort of falls in that category. Like benzodiazepines aren't usually used for seizures, but they are used for status epilepticus uh, specifically. So keep that in mind. So, um, yeah. And lastly, if the seizure doesn't stop, even with the IV ep anti-epileptic medications, you put them under, gen you put the patient under general anesthesia because keep in mind in status epilepticus, the neurons keep firing constantly all the time, all the time. Eventually they'll like, you know, there's limited amount of energy in the brain. There's no storage form of energy around the brain. So they will run out of ATP eventually. And when they do run out of ATP, they start undergoing apoptosis, necrosis, all that stuff. And they begin dying. And obviously that causes permanent brain damage. So we kind of need to stop that. So if the medication are failing to stop the seizure, then we put the patient under general anesthesia with either propofol, thiopental, and then we give even more anti-epileptic medications to stop the seizure. Remember, anesthesia doesn't stop the seizure. It just puts the patient unconscious. And then you add more anti-epileptic medication to try to stop the seizure. And hopefully from there, it will stop. So that's for status epilepticus. Um, any questions before I move on? I kind of talked for a long time. Any? Is everything clear, guys? All good? Any confusion? All right, perfect. All right, perfect. If you, like, at any point, if you guys need me to re-explain anything, um, let me know. Like, even if it's, like, the first slide of this lecture, just let me know. It's fine. All right. So, some random facts uh, that I found that are probably important for you is that like I, I didn't find a place to fit these in but focal seizures usually happen most commonly in the temporal lobe so epilepsy of the temporal lobe is the most likely site for a focal seizure and this like if it is epilepsy there is no underlying cause then the condition that probably is causing this uh, or sorry, causing these seizures is mesial temporal sclerosis. It's covered in the lecture. I'll go over it in a bit. What this means is that the temporal lobe hardens in some areas. The neurons just 
sort of transform into this hard material and tissue changes. And obviously this makes the temporal lobe in this case non-functional and it can trigger seizures. We don't know why this happens. It just kind of does. So I don't deal with it. Um, what do we call it? So sometimes in questions, um, myoclonic epilepsy is described as muscle twitching in children immediately after waking up in the morning. So remember how uh, clonic, uh, let me go back to it here. Where was it? It goes right here. Remember when we mentioned clonic seizures look like myoclonic seizures? So the way you tell them apart in questions, usually they, they specify that it happens in, uh, oh, well, I spoiled the question. Too bad. Uh, <laughs> what do we call it? Uh, in children, uh, uh, it happens immediately after waking up and the muscle twitching is pretty quick. So it's one hint. You can probably tell them apart. I don't know. It, it probably happens a lot in these patients, but this is the way questions are usually formed around myoclonic epilepsy. So just something to remember. All right, so that concludes the condensed form of this, uh, you know, of this lecture. I put what is most important into this. Um, I'll quickly run through al qawis slide. I mostly covered everything he mentioned. There are some specific, specific points I want to point out. I didn't think they were as important, but I'll still go through them. But before that, I'll just put some questions for you guys to answer. Uh, I'll explain them very quickly. So please go ahead and take your time reading them. And, uh, you know, uh, you can answer them in the chat. You don't have to answer them in the chat if you feel embarrassed. Um, uh, I'll just answer the question in like two minutes. E. Hmm. <clears throat> Well, you know, a better idea would be reading it out loud. So a seven-year-old boy is brought to the physician for a recurrent three to four minute episode of facial grimacing and st staring over the past month. Uh, Non-responsive uh, during these episodes and doesn't remember anything afterward. He has a muddy taste in the mouth right before the onset of symptoms. A week ago, there was an episode and he started making gestures. He felt lethargic after the incident and was confused. Examination shows no abnormalities. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? All right. So, um, some of you guys mentioned A. Some of you guys mentioned E. So, the answer in this case um, is... Um, one second. It's A. So... Why is it not E and why is it A here? So, uh, one of you asked me, why is it not A? It is A. Um, what do we call it? The reason it's A and not E in this case. All right. So the reason it's A and not E in this case is remember when I said to you, Absan seizures are the seizures that have no post exal confusion right after. This patient felt lethargic and confused right after the seizure itself. Um, what do we call it? When the patient is lethargic and confused right after the seizure, this immediately excludes uh, Absan seizures. It no longer is the most likely cause because Absan seizures do not have post-ectal confusion right after. Um, in this case, the patient is experiencing facial grimacing and staring, meaning he's having one symptom or one specific set of symptoms, meaning that it is not affecting the entire body. So it is not a generalized seizure. It's not affecting like your face, the muscles, the legs, all that. It's not like a tonic clonic seizure. It's just one portion, which is the face. And that's why we can immediately think it is a focal seizure. And because it is a focal seizure, now the only thing left to do is whether it is a simple seizure or a complex seizure or loss of consciousness or without loss of consciousness. So because there is a loss of consciousness in this case, um, what do we call it? Where is it here? He's not responsive. He doesn't remember these episodes afterwards, meaning he did lose consciousness during these episodes. So this is why it is impaired awareness in this case. All right. Next question. Any confusion about this question actually before like we 
uh, move on to the next question, last question. Yeah. If you want me to explain any further. Clear? Cool. All right. All right, next question. So, a nine-year-old boy is brought to the physician by his mother to establish care after moving to a new city. He lives at home with his mother and older brother. He was having trouble in school. He was started on ethosuximide by a previous physician. He's now performing well in school. This patient is undergoing treatment for a condition that most likely presents with which of the following symptoms? So A, regression of verbal skills and stereotyped hand wringing, limited attention span and poor impulse control, overwhelming daytime sleepiness and, hypo and hypnagogic hallucinations, Episodic jerky movements of the arm with impaired consciousness, frequent episodes of blank staring and eye fluttering, or recurrent motor tics and involuntary obscene speech. Uh, everyone is answering E. And let's see. All right, drum roll. One second. All right, it is E. <laughs> Hold on, guys. And why is it not D? Okay. Um, let's see. So let me explain why it's E first, and I'll explain to you why it's not D. Uh, one moment. So again, this patient is treated with ethosuximide. Um, this when ethosuximide, like the only time you see ethosuximide mentioned, is during um what do we call it, is during absence seizures. So this immediately tells you that the patient has absence seizures. There's no other condition that is treated with ethosuximide except absence seizures. That's the only condition that's treated this way. Or sorry, that's the only med condition that this medication treats. So you can immediately tell this is an absence or absence seizure. So what exactly happens in an absence seizure now that you need to think about it? So again, the patient loses consciousness for a few seconds. They blankly stare. They don't fall down. They don't have any motor manifestations. Their muscles don't start twitching. None of that stuff. They just stare into the abyss. Their eyes start flickering. Uh, uh, sorry, their eyelids start going uh, up and down. They start fluttering. And then a few seconds later, they regain consciousness. There's no post-ectal confusion. And uh, they continue from there. So that is the typical presentation of a absence seizure. So D in this case, episodic jerky movements of the arm with impaired consciousness doesn't describe an absence seizure. It describes a seizure we discussed earlier, which is the focal seizure with impaired awareness. So one side of the body is affected and they're losing consciousness. So the seizure is only affecting one portion of the brain and they're losing consciousness. That's why it's a focal seizure with impaired awareness. Um, overwhelming daytime sleepiness with hypnagogic hallucinations. This is a condition known as, uh, what was it called again? Um, what was the opposite of insomnia? I, I forgot what it was called, but, um, uh, <laughs> wait, okay. It's on my mind now. One second, let me check guys. Uh. What was it called? I don't remember. Oh yeah, it was called hy hypersomnia, something like that. Hypersomnia. So th this is usually the presentation. You don't need to know this. This is just fun fact. But yeah. Uh, this is uh, what do we call it? This is a de developmental problem. This is uh, probably ADHD. Um, and this is Tourette syndrome. So all of these are like different syndromes. You don't need to know any of this if you haven't taken it. But this is the, the typical presentation of an absence seizure. This is the presentation you will find all the time. All right. So uh, that concludes the, the condensed form of the lecture. I'll quickly go over Al-Qawi's slide. Feel free to leave if you uh, don't feel like you need anything else. But uh, I'll quickly just run over some important slides that I like m slightly less important from this uh, condensed form. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, and we should be done from there. So just give me a second to pull out the, the other, like the lecture itself. You're welcome. All right, so I'll quickly just run through the slides. Shouldn't take more than 10 minutes, hopefully. So let me pause, let me resume here. All right, so let's quickly get over this and uh, we'll, we'll wrap up from there. So th this is stuff we already covered. This is the neuroscience, all of that. You don't need to know this stuff for his lecture. Like this is just explaining the normal physiology of things. Uh, it's just telling you that epilepsy is not contagious, not a mental illness, not a cognitive disability, yada, 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 not very important. It may occur with different conditions like cerebral palsy, autism, ADD, all of that. But usually it doesn't. Uh, there are causes of provoked seizures, as we mentioned, hypoglycemia, alcohol withdrawal, fever, medications, drug toxicity, all of these are known causes of seizures and they don't lead to a diagnosis of epilepsy. Basically, if you treat these things, you don't have, uh, you won't have seizures anymore. And that's why it's not epilepsy in this case. Prevalence, incidence, this is fun fact. You don't need to know this stuff. You don't need to know this stuff. This is the classifications between these two types of seizures. We already discussed this, we already discussed this. Focal seizures, generalized seizures, all of this stuff, lovely stuff. So causes of symptomatic epilepsy. So again, these are the causes we, we discussed. Remember the vitamins we talked about? So these are here. So parts of the seizure. So if the seizure affects the leg, you have leg manifestations. These are for focal seizures, affects the body, body manifestations, reading, you know, reading manifestations, sight, hallucinations, hearing, you start hearing things, et cetera, et cetera. So again, focal seizures are divided to seizures that have uh, loss of consciousness and no loss of consciousness. So all of this stuff we've already covered. Again, we've already covered this stuff, cerebrovascular, CNS, toxic, trauma, metabolic, all of this stuff. And, uh, okay, so mesial temporal sclerosis, you diagnose it by MRI, very important. It's basically a structural problem with the brain. Again, it is the most likely cause of focal seizures that are in the temporal lobe, remember that. So what happens is, you don't need to know the histology, but there's basically neurons start changing into this stroma type thing. They start hardening and uh, basically they can trigger seizures. Uh, another similar structural problem is called a cavernous angioma. Angioma is a tumor of blood vessels, it's benign, but blood vessels just have an abnormal structure and they can cause a what do we call it? They can cause like a collection of fluid and uh, this can compress the brain and trigger a seizure as well. And like in this case, this legion right here is a cavernous angioma. You can just remember the picture and that's enough here. So again, generalized seizures affect the entire brain. There are different types. We covered all of these. Uh, by the way, by the way, just uh, if you're confused here, JME stands for Juvenile Myoclonic Epilepsy. <clears throat> this is an EEG pattern. You don't need to know this. This is beyond the level. So these are some symptoms of tonic-clonic seizures, prodrome, again, aura, same thing. They can have anxiety, concentration difficulty, lightheadedness, all of this stuff. You can read it. You don't need to know it exactly. The tonic phase is contractions. There could be an epileptic cry. Look it up, by the way. I can't exactly describe it to you. Just write on YouTube, epileptic cry, and Basically, what happens is the moment the tonic-clonic seizure starts, there are muscles in the larynx over here. They contract all at once, and that causes a cry to happen, like, ah, you get me? So uh, this is why this occurs. Um, and the clonic phase can have specific clonic jerks. This is the most important thing here. It can have blinks because of the jerks. It can have cyanosis because the, uh, again, the tracheal, or sorry, the laryngeal muscles are constricting the airway, and this can cause cyanosis as well. So, absence seizures, pediatrics, brief loss of consciousness, consciousness, and eye fluttering. So, again, how do you evaluate? First, uh, it's the same steps I described for you earlier. Remember, step one, make sure it's a seizure. Step two, 
uh, is it first time? Is it a recurring seizure? And if it's a first time, you do history, uh, history, physical exam, uh, cardiovascular and neurological examination, blood pressure, 12 lead ECG, blood work, uh, CVC, uh, imaging, all of that. You try to find the cause. If you don't find the cause, then you can uh, consider diagnosing epilepsy. So this is just a, just a way to reach this diagnosis, all of this stuff. These are all imaging modalities. Um, two things I want you to know from this slide that are kind of unique. Remember the prolactin level. Remember that within 10 to 10, 10 to 20 minutes of a tonic clonic seizure, it could be five, five to 30 times above baseline. I would remember this. They might ask you about it. And uh, what do we call it? And one more thing, where was it? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, it's right here. Pleocytosis around uh, basically more cells. Uh, there's an increase in cells in the CSF. Just remember this. You don't need to remember exactly. You don't need to know why they happen. Just remember this stuff. It's very niche stuff. Sometimes they like to ask about this, you know, dumb little small things. So just remember them from there. And let's see, anything else? Um, Again, treatments. So um, I would remember these drugs. So remember, there are first-line drugs. Remember, epilepsy is treated with anti-epileptic medication. First-time seizures or seizures that have a cause usually are not treated with anti-epileptic medications. Remember, it's epilepsy that's treated this way. And the first-line drugs are valproate, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, phenytoin. And uh, the second-line drug is levetiracetam. So remember these drugs for first line and second line, just the underlying ones. And remember the principle we talked about earlier, you start with one drug, you increase the dose, and then you add another drug. You see these slides right here about the categories of anti-epileptic drugs? You can skip all these. You don't need to know this stuff from the clinical lecture. You get them from the pharma lecture. I'm pretty sure there is a pharma lecture on anti-epileptic drugs. Just get all the mechanism of actions, all this stuff from there. This is where they ask you from it. Clinical lectures will not ask you about pharma drugs. So all of this stuff, cool. Again, this stuff, I'm pretty sure that this was listed in the pharma lecture. If not, you can go over it here. Uh, you don't need to know exactly what drug treats which type of seizure, except one case, which is the absence seizure. Notice how the only drug that treats an absence seizure is uh, or that's uh, sorry, the only seizure that and uh, this ethosuximide treats is the Epson seizure. You could treat Epson seizures with valproate or lamotrigine, but uh, these have like specific underlying indications. You do not need to know them if they're not mentioned in the pharma lecture. Uh, interestingly, ketogenic diets I forgot to mention this, but ketogenic diets can help with epilepsy. Um, you can remember this uh, this stuff. Sometimes they like to ask about the ratio, so just remember this stuff. Uh, this is like fancy stuff. Uh, remember when they're started. Uh, basically, all this does is that it helps control seizures. For there's evidence behind them stopping seizures, the ketogenic diet. So just remember that. And uh, obviously, the uh, epilepsy sucks. The effects quality of the life, quality of life. A lot of people with, uh, epile with uh, uh, epilepsy have depression, so it's very important to treat uh, epilepsy, whether symptomatically or like curatively, whether it's this or that. Very important. So we cannot ignore these seizures. And one last thing I forgot to mention in the slides is something known as sudden unexplained death due to epilepsy. Uh, SUDEP. Usually this occurs because of generalized tonic clonic seizures or two uh, or uh, like, oh, sorry, they're more, you're a, a patient is higher at a higher risk of sudden unexplained death because of general, if they have generalized tonic clonic epilepsy or they're already on two anti epileptic drugs. Because what, like, when they're on two anti epileptic drugs, this means that their seizures are so severe that they need more than two anti-epileptic medications to control it, that means that they're more likely to die of seizure. Uh, basically, all this means is that they die, like a patient dies due to epilepsy, but like there's no under, other underlying explanation for death besides the epilepsy itself. Like we can't say, oh, he had a heart disease, that's why he died. 
No, it's like, oh, he had a seizure before he died, and then he died, and we're not exactly sure why he died, so let's blame it on the seizure. This is all this means. Again, uh, this is for drug-resistant epilepsy. Failure to achieve sustained seizure freedom despite two trials of uh, anti-epileptic drugs is uh, known as failure of treatment or drug-resistant epilepsy. It's also called intractable epilepsy, and it could be due to multiple causes. Uh, the most important is medial, mesial temporal sclerosis and uh, uh, cavernous angiomas. Um, there could be problems with uh, the actual disease itself. It could be like different things, like they have different uh, effects on the quality of life. But the most important thing is to remember mesial temporal sclerosis, cavernomas, all that stuff. And uh, what do we call it? There are multiple factors as to why these patients don't have, what do we call it, controlled epilepsy despite medication. Um, Sometimes it is because of failure to take medication, but make sure to review, like before we like blame it on medication not working, as I mentioned earlier, we make sure that they're not like having any of this stuff, make sure that they're actually taking the medication, whether the medication is actually working and achieving like normal serum levels. They're not drinking alcohol. They're not sleep deprived because sleep deprivation can lead to seizures as well. Stress and illnesses, they're not, they don't have meningitis. They don't have encephalitis. They don't have hormonal problems like hyper or hypothyroidism. They don't have hypoglycemia, diabetes, all of that stuff. Make sure this is all not there. And then you can tell uh, whether or not the actual medication is not working. And when it is not working, then we have specific approaches to treat them. Um, we can have something known as focal resection. Resection meaning removing specific portions of the brain. You can remove these specific portions and that can curatively treat a seizure. Not 100% effective, but it, it, it has like a good, good amount of efficacy in patients. Like it's sort of a last resort. It's like, okay, we've tried everything. I'm suffering a lot. I, I, I can't stand this anymore, doctor. I, I don't want to do this anymore. So then you can consider these things. So the most important one is focal resection. These are kind of outdated. They're kind of extreme conditions. So a hemispheroctomy is taking, you know how the brain is made of two hemispheres? You take one of them out. So this is kind of like sort of aggressive. And uh, last line, last line, last line is telostomy. So you know the cor corpus callosum? They take, it connects the right side of the brain with the left side of the brain. They go ahead and cut it in half to interrupt this communication. This is not curative, this is palliative, meaning it's symptomatically treating the patient because th th this is again, last resort, usually not done. But when it is done, know that the patient has literally tried everything to get to this point. And finally, we have stimulation that can treat intractable epilepsy. These are like, um, again, this is a temporary solution. This is not permanent, it's palliative. Again, this is surgical, when do we do it? Last resort, that's the most important thing. And for brain stimulation, there are specific techniques. The most important one like that I would recommend knowing is uh, vagus nerve stimulation. Basically what they do, they put something, um, they put a, an electrode, they stimulate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is responsible for parasympathetic activity. It shuts down the brain. That can cause the, uh, the that can, so there is evidence behind it through controlling epilepsy symptomatically. It's not a permanent solution. Eventually, the epilepsy will come back, but it is something to consider. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, they send magnetic waves to the brain, and that can obviously uh, symptomatically treat the patient. Again, these are like pretty complicated stuff. You don't need to know the details of them. Again, deep brain stimulation, all that stuff. Very, very complicated. They're not going to ask you about it. They, if they're ever going to ask you about this sort of thing, they're going to ask you about, okay, so give us examples of brain stimulation technique. It could be like an SAQ question or something. Example of brain stimulation techniques that can be used for intractable epilepsy. And then you would list vagus nerve stimulation, transcalar magnetic stimulation, all of that stuff. But again, very, very unlikely that they'll even ask you about this in the first place, but just keep them in the back of your head. Again, uh, you don't need to know the details here. Not very important. Same, not very important. Um, again, not very important, but just remember, uh, 
that these procedures come with a risk, especially brain stimulation right here, deep brain stimulation. Sometimes there's bleeding. You're like sort of sending waves to the brain that can trigger a bleed, can trigger a stroke. It can trigger an infection because sometimes these things are invasive. They take a portion of the skull out. They shove an electrode and they start stimulating. So that can introduce infection. Um, it can cause, if you cut the vagus nerve, uh, this is in vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, you can get cough, hoarseness of the voice, pain, paresthesia. These are all vagus nerve manifestations, vocal cord paralysis, all of that stuff. And for, uh, what do we call it? For magnetic stimulation, the one mentioned above here, where was it? Uh, not here. It was, this, uh, yeah, right here. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Some of the risks include seizures. <laughs> it can cause seizures, which is, you know, why? But, uh, yeah. And it can cause headaches and, uh, it can like sort of cause pain in the head, like scalp discomfort and all of that. Finally, again, status epilepticus. Again, in the lecture, it's defined as 30 minutes. Stick to this definition, please. Uh, death occurs in five to ten percent of patients. Very, very serious conditions. They can they can die because of pyrexia, which is too high of a temperature, coma. They, their circulation might collapse, and uh, it may occur in any portion of the brain. And the treatment is as soon as possible with intravenous anti-epileptic medication. If they don't have a response, general anesthesia with propofol, thiopentone, and anti-epileptic medication on top of that. He forgot to mention it here. But uh, yeah, that's about all. Um, this is not very important. Uh, uh, basically, status epilepticus can be convulsive, meaning related to muscles. It can be non-convulsive, basically just diminished consciousness and confusion. And uh, this is a this is not very important. Just remember that. There are two types of status epilepticus, one that is motor and the other isn't. That's enough. You don't need to know the details here. And yeah, that concludes the entire uh, PAL session. If you guys have any questions, go ahead. Like uh, if you guys want any, you know, tips, tricks for, you know, exam, clinical lectures, studying, all that, go ahead and ask whatever you guys want. Like uh, five minutes for questions. If you guys want to leave, go ahead. But yeah, thanks for attending. And uh, if you want to contact me, I left, uh, where was it? I left my contact information somewhere over here. I have no idea where I left it, but it's on the slide. So yeah, that's about all, guys. Any questions? Any concerns? Oh yeah, it was right here. Any questions or concerns? Anything? Anything that's not clear, I can re-explain. We have all day. <clears throat> all right, awesome. You're welcome, guys. Um, again, just some quick tips before I, you know, close everything. Um, clinical lectures, focus on the superficial stuff. Don't jump into. There's like a hundred slides in some of them. You don't need to know everything. Focus on the superficial bits. Focus on the things that are unique. Like, okay, so wait, if a succamide treats this, okay, that's interesting. Focus on that sort of thing. And don't focus too much on the management. It's not very important at your level. I will send the PPT to you. Um, I'll send it to, I think Amina is the one that's responsible for this. Uh, I'll send it to you and you can share it. And uh, yeah, anything with a clinical lecture, just stay superficial. Don't delve into the details. On the management, when you're focusing on management, just know the steps. Like what would be the next step after taking history? What would be the next step after doing this? What would be the next step after doing that? Focus on that sort of thing. Don't focus on the specific management. Don't know, okay, if a patient comes in with this sort of seizure, I need to do this, this, this drug in this dose in this amount of uh, medication. You know, you know stuff. not very important. That's that's fourth year, fifth year rotations. You, There's plenty of that to happen during that year. So focus on just the superficial bits and that's enough. And uh, yeah, that's about all, guys. Um, I'll send you the PowerPoints in just a minute. Thank you. Thank you again for attending. If you have any questions, I left my number at the very, very beginning of this right here. I left my email too if you don't want to text me. 
Um, feel free to text me at any time for any concerns you have, whether it's the actual lecture that we just did or the, what do we call it, or any clinical lecture. I'm happy to respond to anything. Uh, thank you guys. Have a wonderful day and uh, I'll see you next time.